The opinions of the commentator or commentators are solely those of the commentators and not of CJAD 800 or Bell Media. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 706, welcome to today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller. Hello, Josh. Hello. Nice to see you again after a short uh, break. And uh, tonight on the show, we'll have uh, Jason Hatem of Iconic Brands, and he does uh, some alcohol imports, so that should be fun in a little bit. It should be. It should be tasty, too. Excellent. We'll talk about email marketing as well later on the program. Um, But first, let's get to some entrepreneurial news of the week, shall we? And um, Stephanie Dar which was coming up uh, later in the program, uh, sent me this pretty interesting story. Uh, the Psychological Price of Entrepreneurship. You can read this um, on Inc.com. And it's a pretty interesting story, uh, just how about how, how taxing being an entrepreneur is on your emotional state, on your family life. Um, something that uh, that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, myself included, weren't quite prepared for at first. I, I was going to say, you you probably can <laughs> can talk, can rattle on a whole bunch of information oh, yeah. for for half an hour with your own business. But uh, and there's no doubt, and we've we've you know when we interview entrepreneurs here and guests, they're they're calm, they're cool, they're collected. But that's just you know an hour of their presence. Uh, that's that's not necessarily a normal day. A normal day can be far more hectic than that. Uh, you know, from finance issues to labor issues uh, to marketing to product issues. I mean, there, there's so much that can go well, but so much that can go wrong. And for for any entrepreneur to deal with that and move on to the next day, I mean, you know, how many times have we asked the question of entrepreneurs, was there ever a point where you wanted to give up? Like, you know, at what point do you say, oh, maybe it's not worth it anymore? And invariably... They've all come back and said, yeah, there was this one point. However, they pushed through. So what pushed them through? The, the push through was their true desire, their belief in their product, their belief in themselves. And of course, that's the message. That's from the top. When you're talking about creating a culture in a company, you really it comes from the top and saying, I'm not going to be defeated. I don't want to let anybody else in my company know that it can be defeated. We can make it happen. We can go and move forward. But there is a huge balance of psychology, good and bad, that flows with it. What would you would be your your advice to to people listening who maybe are new entrepreneurs or uh, would like to start a business? What should they prepare for first, just in terms of uh, of their their life in general? Uh, you know, how how many hours should they expect to work? For example, uh, is, you, it, is if, are there any rules there? Uh, well, I, I, the rule is if you're starting from scratch, you've basically donated your life to this project for the next year or two or ten or whatever, but at least for the next year because. Only you can make it, really push it the way you want to see it. You'll take time to build a team around you and impart that knowledge and have that vision shared. But only you, if, if it's your vision and your startup, only you will really see how it goes. So if you're not prepared to invest 90% of your hours, uh, then and I, you, you really got to question it. Because entrepreneurs, they live, they eat, they breathe what they believe, what they sell, the product, the service, and the, and nobody does it better than them. Here's another uh, frustration for entrepreneurs uh, that they may not be expecting, and this is from the Sage Business Index survey. Uh, they found that the most challenging aspect to running a business in Canada is... Taxes? Yeah, not a big surprise there, I guess. Uh, taxes, by far, uh, according to this survey, the most frustrating part of being an entrepreneur. Um, is this pretty much consistent with uh, what you see every day? Well, I'll, I'll say it's not It's not necessarily just the taxes side of it. I'll call it compliance. Hmm. I'll call it filling out of the forms and making sure all the remittances are done and all the all the compliance work, all the all the rules are followed and all the paperwork. You know, for, for a society that's going uh, paperless, it's amazing how many trees we kill. And any business, you know, from the moment they sign up, and a lot of things can be done online, but it's still compliance, it's still it's still legwork, it's still tedious, whether it's signing up to register your business, whether it's signing up for sales taxes, payroll taxes, and then the frequency of reporting, whether it's monthly or quarterly. 
Sometimes it's annually, but then you can kind of let it get away from you if you're not a good planner. Uh, and then, and then of course, if you have employees, you have the CSST and, and all the labor rules that follow it and pay equity and all the, I mean, we live in a, in a, in a lovely, uh, economic, slightly socialistic environment. So that in and of, that in and of itself comes with a hell of a lot of compliance with it. So yes, you can call it taxes, but the reality is it's a lot of compliance and paperwork that goes with it that you can certainly pull your hair out. Another interesting story, uh, talking about uh, the size of government and how that affects uh, uh, the business world. Um, this is from the Globe and Mail, uh, Michael Babad writing why Canada's bloated public sector is uh, is actually a good thing. And he says with uh, unemployment uh, going to 6.8%, um, those kinds of jobs are what Canada desperately needs. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, there, there's a couple of things that run through my head when you when you're mentioning that. One is, yeah, it's a good thing that they're creating employment. Uh, you know, it's a good thing that that people are earning a, a decent wage and and can go out and buy a premium beer such as Kronbacher <laughs> that we'll talk about shortly. That uh, I have, you know, to tell you if I like it or not. Uh, and then there's the other side that say, you know what, but how many dollars are wasted? And when I'm out going out to hire somebody, if they are getting so many perks at a government level because there's a huge pension and there's there's all these vacation days or, or what have you and whatnot, and they come to an environment where you really want to work them just a wee bit harder, uh, even though you might pay them a touch more, that's, that's, where, that's where the battle can begin. And... Unfortunately, some people don't have a longer term vision and always just want to say the grass or think the grass is greener on the other side. So it creates creates a bit of a challenge for uh, for entrepreneurs when they go out hiring. And a bit of jealousy too between uh, uh, a bit of animosity between the public and private sectors because as he writes in the piece here, um, quoting here, uh, workers in the private sector earn $8,150 a year less uh, than their public sector counterparts and work six hours more per week. Well, that's uh, that's a question of supply and demand, uh, and 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 the talents, and the reality is when you're building something, when you're looking forward, it's. I mean, there's so many factors that go into it. Now, what are the actual talents? What's the capacity of the people? It, I would say it's very difficult to compare. It's not an apples to apples discussion. You might say that the average earns more, but what exactly are people doing and working, and what's the end result of it all? Like you know, at the end of it, are they do they have a capacity to actually earn more, to actually get their foot in the company, to do whatever else that that might be beneficial and churn the economy and add to their pockets more? I don't think the article uh, or the comparison really addresses that. This next one from uh, Fortune magazine, and uh, I know you're you guys at Fuller Landau are a big believer in in corporate responsibility and and community involvement sure. and and starting conversations about important issues. But this one, I'm not so sure about the Starbucks thing about race. Mm. So they wanted us to put this uh, this race together campaign, and uh, you know mark it down on the on your coffee cups uh, when they give it to you. Uh, hashtag race together, all with the goal of uh, getting people talking about an important societal issue. Um, but it's it's kind of becoming an, a bit of an awkward fit. So, how, as a what what should you consider? I suppose if you're if you're a uh, entrepreneur looking to make an impact socially, but um, maybe it's best to stay away from the more dicier issues, especially when you when we're talking about race, because it's hard to pull that off with uh, with any degree of I guess uh, unanimity. Well, well, there's no question when an entrepreneur is going to go out and market themselves or find a campaign, uh, you would like to think that. Any decision or any any idea that comes out, they fully thought out. What's the impact? What's the potential repercussion? Is it going to affect a certain group of people or the public in its entirely, in its entirety? Excuse me, but you know they really got to think ahead and race together. While it sounds great because you want to get a whole group of people behind, regardless of weight, shape, size, country, whatever it may be. Uh, that might have repercussions, especially coming from what might be perceived as a little bit of a company that sells mostly to the mainstream population. And I think any entrepreneur, the lesson that you learn is, that's great, be creative, you want to go out and have a campaign, fantastic. But just kind of understand and, and know what the potential repercussions are. And if that happens, deal with it and deal with it quickly. Don't don't ignore it. Don't let it go because it can just get far worse. 
And the PR side of me is just saying, uh, be, be be conscious of the risk, because especially with the race issue, I'm not so sure this is a winner for Starbucks. Uh, yikes, it could get dicey. No, but I understand entrepreneurs that want to be different because the, mm. the competition, um, too many people play it safe. So you want to be remembered. Some people say that there's no such thing as bad publicity. Well, I don't know if that's the case and your your PR mind might come out and, and say otherwise, mm-hmm. but the name is out there and I guess it depends who you are. Coming up next on Today's Entrepreneur, Jason Hatem of Iconic Brands is our profile for the evening. We'll talk to Jason in just a moment, but first, 7.15. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. No, 720 on CJ8800. Welcome back to Today's Entrepreneur, inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar and Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you. And this evening, we welcome our profile. It's uh, it's Jason Hatem from Iconic Brands. Jason, welcome to CJ8. Thanks. So uh, first question is uh, always the, uh, the easiest. Tell me about yourself and tell me about Iconic Brands. All right. So I've started, uh, I started Iconic Brands about uh, five years ago or so. Um, I got my first job in the beer industry eight years ago. I was working for Heineken as a, as a sales rep for a couple of years. Um, and long story short, uh, working, working with Heineken, I met people, I met essentially the distributors for a, uh, the Canadian distributor for a, a German beer called Kronbacher. Um, so when I stopped working for, uh, for Heineken with that relationship, uh, that I developed, uh, Kronbacher was looking to, uh, set up their distribution across Canada a little bit more aggressively. And they didn't have any representation in Quebec, so they had asked me if um, if I was interested. So at the time, I knew nothing nothing really more than than just basically selling beer to bars and restaurants. Uh, but I did a little bit of research and uh, figured out what it took to really bring in a new beer into the province. Uh, and the uh, the list was pretty overwhelming. the The requirements to uh, to get permits uh, were 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 somewhat intimidating, um, but. After some discussions with the brewery, we decided that it would uh, make sense to try to pursue that. I mean, Quebec's a very unique uh, market for beer in the sense that we're one of the only provinces in Canada where you can actually sell beer privately. So we have access to about 10,000 licensed points of sale. So so just just before you continue, uh, really what you do is you're, you're a private importer of beer and spirits. That's really what the focus of Iconic Brands is. Yeah, I'd say beverages more, beverages, more broadly. Okay. I have a, a water product as well. Uh, my business is focused uh, around beer, but yeah, distributor of a uh, beverage distributor, yeah. Now, what did you, I, I know you kind of worked for, for the company before, but did you ha- did you do this right out of school? Like, like where did the idea come from personally? I, I did it right out of school. I, I, got a, I got an interview through a friend of mine, um, I think it was the day before I was writing my final exam uh, at Concordia. Um, I wasn't even really looking for a job, but I got an interview for that Heineken job. Um, so I took it. I figured it would be worthwhile to to check it out, and I ended up getting that job. And so the rest is, I mean, the rest just kind of fell into place, um, just th- through the relationships that I made uh, working for them. So it wasn't really something that was planned. It kind of just happened. Well, that's listen. A lot of things just kind of happen, but you have to be in the right place at the right time. There's no question about yeah. it. So did it, was this something that you, you felt could really be long-term? Like when you, when you <laughs> went into this, did you actually have a vision of what it could be? Or did you really kind of go and saying, well, let's try one thing and we'll see where it goes from there? Uh, I mean, I saw the potential for, for the brand Kronbacher in and of itself. Uh, I was looking for, for something to do really too at the time or something to get into. Um, so I, I wasn't really thinking that long term at the back then. It was more, you know, thinking about the next day, week, month kind of thing. Um, but, you know, w- once I saw the potential for the brand, I saw how large the brewery was and sort of, again, it's sort of lucky that that brewery kind of fell in my lap, but starting to see the scale of, of the brewery and the products that they had and how popular they were in Europe, I did realize that there was definitely a lot of potential for those products here, but I, I also realized at the same time it would be very, uh, very challenging. Coming up on a Today's Entrepreneur, more with Jason Haddam of Iconic Brands. Uh, right now it's 724. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 726 on today's entrepreneur. Our guest this evening is Jason Haddam of Iconic Brands, and uh, they distribute, among other things, uh, this uh, lovely. Is it a lager? 
Yeah, Jason. Yeah, Pilsner. Uh, Pilsner. 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 Sorry, Krumbacher uh, Pilsner from uh, from Germany, uh, which is uh, quite delightful. I have we have sampled it, and uh, so uh, Josh, we move on to a bit of marketing. Well, I, I think I was kind of curious, you know, when uh, because Jason started doing this right when he got out of school, so and. This is a private import business. This is this is not something that you you know you're going to pick up uh, a, a paper clip and go sell it. You know this is something that requires a, some planning and probably a hell of a lot of paperwork. So, w- with with the the maybe little knowledge that you gained with the with the Heineken position or whatever, where what was the first step that you felt you had to do in starting this? Uh, the first thing I did, I w- I'd say, is a lot of just research. Research. I mean, it wasn't so much about the technicalities of opening a business I had done that before um, so that that kind of stuff I had a good understanding for it was really the the research specifically related to importing a beer so um, it's somewhat difficult to get all the information you need because there's a lot of different government entities involved so there's the Régie d'Alcool there's the SAQ there's Récit Québec uh, so you're dealing with multiple different agencies you're getting pieces of information from each one they don't really communicate well with each other so you're kind of piecing everything together and trying to gather as much information as possible and i mean there's so much more that i just discovered a- along the way that i just sort of stumbled stumbled upon but the first step was definitely just doing a lot of research gathering as much information about really what it took so you had to get, obtain a permit did it take a long time to get like before you could actually import your first beverage how yeah. long did it? How long did that process take to get the permits? Uh, the the beer, um, they're not importers' permits because the SAQ is always the importer of record of any alcohol mm-hmm. in the province. They're they're actually warehousing and distribution permits, so they give you the right to warehouse and distribute the products. Uh, yes, it took very long. It took uh, from the day I deposited the permit application uh, to the day I received stock in my warehouse about eighteen months. Wow! And uh, obviously, there was some preparation that happened before that. You know, so close to. 20 months or so. So uh, what I did in the meantime is I actually took on another job working for a, uh, a spirit and wine distributor and agent. Now, now you, you started talking with Krumbacher, like I guess earlier on in the process. So did they, they were behind you, they had patience, they helped you out, they were, they were a good partner to have? Yeah, definitely. So that's, that's one of the most important things here. Um, they were patient and aggressive at the same time. They were resourceful. Uh, they're obviously a very large company, but they're independent, which is unique to find such a large beer uh, who's not owned by a conglomerate. So they they really um, they're really well organized when it comes to their exports. They have a dedicated export manager who travels, you know, the sixty countries that she covers, mm-hmm. uh, and she made an effort to be here as much as possible in that in that uh, early in that early period. Um, but she really made an effort to also understand the process, so she could then explain it to her boss who's essentially the owner, owner of the brewery uh and there was a lot that that was required of them too so they really dedicated the resources necessary not necessarily financial resources it's not all that of a, of a costly process the application it's a, it's a lot of human resources in terms of getting paperwork and getting forms filled out and and i presume that you also i mean you had to prove yourself at some point or you have to put some skin in the game or let them find a way to trust you so when we come back from the break we'll talk about that and some uh, you know how you market this product that's that's new to the province jason haddam of iconic brands are with us this evening on today's entrepreneur at 7:30 for professional advice with a personal touch consult fuller landau chartered professional accountants and business advisors click on flmontreal.com Welcome back to today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller, and our guest this evening, Jason Haddam of Iconic Brands. And Josh, they import uh, beer and alcohol and uh, delicious substances like Krumbacher. Bacher. Krumbacher. Bacher. Like Bacher. But yeah, it's it's it comes back to an old. Uh, never mind, I won't go to old movies. But uh, when we when we left before the break, uh, you know, it's it's a large German company. It might be independent, but it's a large German company. You're a single guy in Quebec that has limited experience. Was it difficult to prove yourself to this to this company? Uh, yes and no. I think that I mean part of uh, I think we we were sort of both on the same wavelength from the beginning. So again, it comes back to. A little bit of sort of a you know a lucky break I'd say. Uh, the gentleman who was now the president of Kronbacher North America was actually a colleague of mine working for Heineken at the time as well. Mm-hmm. So he was based in Ontario. So he he sort of knew me um, from a work standpoint. 
Uh, we worked together as colleagues for a couple of years. So that facilitated things. And I think the fact that uh, I was able to sort of quickly grasp the uh, their strategy. And although they're a very large brewery, uh, they came in here with sort of that grassroots approach and uh, that commitment. They didn't want to come in and be distributed by a Molson or a Labatt. Uh, and they very well could be. They wanted to really develop the product based on on the product itself. And, and I guess I showed them the ability or the understanding of that philosophy. and. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I didn't really have the opportunity to really prove myself because we couldn't get product in for so long. But uh, I guess I, I did it in that way. Would you say there are a lot of opportunities for, especially in the food and beverage industry, for those who maybe want to uh, lurk around in Europe, find something unique, and then bring it here to North America? I think that what's happening in the in the beer uh, industry over the last five to seven years or so is very interesting in terms of uh, people wanting to try different products. and. These big breweries are losing losing market share steadily year over year, and they're losing it to premium imports and craft beers. And we've all seen all these craft breweries that have popped up in the States mm-hmm. and across Canada, and we have a lot of micro brews here in Quebec. Um, so I think there's an opportunity in the sense that customers want to try different products. I think that it's a big challenge within Quebec because you really need to find the right partner. If you're looking at a European brewery, you need to find one that's big enough but still independent. You need to one, find one that, that has the resources to dedicate to it, not just financial resources, but again, human resources. And uh, and then you have to find someone who really actually wants to be here because Quebec, on the grand scheme of things, is not that big of a market when you're, you're, you're looking internationally. It's a big market as far as Canada goes. But if the brewery is not committed to coming into the province, they can very, very easily be deterred by all the rules and regulations. The permit application process is super complicated. And then once you're through all that, you have uh, language barriers to deal with as well. Now, you, you mentioned there was a lot of this craft beer or, or what some people refer to as microbreweries. There's a lot of competition. There's a lot of individual brands or people trying to create brands. Uh, how do you, do you keep tabs on them? Uh, is, you know, is Kronbacher or yourself, do you worry about so much competition or do you find that, you know what, you really truly believe that this beer is different, it's premium, that it, it will easily stand above the rest? Uh, I, I, I believe that, but I also believe there are a lot of, there are a lot of solid micro brews that are coming out. I think that, um, I think it's a good thing. I think in a sense that we're, we're sort of all the little guys are, are up against them, you know, the bigger InBevs and Molson cores of the world. So I think that the more of them to a certain point, the more of them there are, the better. They're not really stealing market share from me. They'd be stealing market share and creating more of, of, a, of a marketplace, uh, a competitive marketplace. Um, I think that another, another aspect of it is that it's very, very difficult to run a brewery uh, sell your products, deliver your products, provide customer service. So I'm, I'm, I sort of take it for granted, uh, the fact that I'm able to order beer and it arrives on time and it's consistent every time. Uh, and there are never really out of stocks. So I think that to do it all, to do what the micro brews do is a, is a big challenge. So I think that's the advantage that I would say I have over them. You know, you, you, you touched on a subject where it's it's really managing the inventory, managing the deliveries, the 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 import and all that. So there, there's this whole inventory management and cycle uh, and flow that you really need to be on top of. Did, did you have any of that background before? No. What, what are the kind of the, the lessons that you've learned uh, over these last little while importing Krumbacher and whatever else and making sure that, you know, you have just the right, because it's a perishable item as yeah. well. So you got to make sure that you have just the right amount and filling the filling the needs of your consumers without running out, but without having too much that it, that there's waste. Yeah. I mean, no, I didn't really have any experience in it. I was aware of it. It's, um, I have a limited number of SKUs, so it's not overly complicated. But what's difficult is the SAQ does, as they are the importer of record, they force you to import full 40-foot containers. So, you know, when I first brought in containers three years ago, that was a lot of beer for me to be bringing in. So I did have issues with having too much in, uh, inventory. And it's not only really an issue of, you know, the beer has about a year shelf life, so it's not really an issue of having too much inventory that it goes bad because, you know, it, I'll never really hold beer for more than a year. You drink it anyways. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> that's it. But it's a question also of just tying too much money into up into inventory. So that's something that, you know, that I made a couple of mistakes early on. I did have product early on that I had to destroy. Uh, so it's really just something that I, you know, I sort of learned over the last couple of years and I'm, I'll continue to learn. Just my ability to manage inventory. Now that I have better rotations, I'm able to uh, order more frequently 
and try to time things so that I'm, I'm, you know, low enough on inventory. Does the relationship with your with your primary supplier with Kronbacher help greatly? I mean, do they assist in making sure you, the product comes in, and or how? I guess uh, how tied up are you with log- logistics and you know getting stuff on the water to come in on time? Uh, everything I bring in is uh, X Works, so you know I'm responsible for for freight. So they're very good in the sense that you know they're a machine. They're loading containers daily. They'll give you a loading date and it'll be filled that day. So I take care of everything uh, from then on. So I always have to just just manage myself. Give them a couple of weeks to load and you know you know know my know my lead time and 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 order in time. The challenge now really is that uh, I'm I'm still at a small enough level where you know adding on a big enough customer tomorrow could throw off my inventory levels for the next three weeks and potentially cause an out of stock. So it's just a question of being on top of it all the time and reacting. Did you ever, you know, as you're starting out and even today, as you're, as you're continuing to build your business, have you ever said no to a customer? I, I never said no to a customer until recently I started to, to, to do that. It's very tough to turn down sales. Um, but having been, you know, burned by a couple of customers that either didn't pay me or dealing with some customers that would just stretch Mm-hmm. How long it took them to pay me, I'm starting to realize now that sometimes it's just better not to do that business or if it's very low margin business, I'd probably be better with that inventory and sell it to someone else and have the money in my bank account. So uh, I probably starting this year, I would say 2015, I've actually started to turn customers down mostly for those reasons. The year of no. <laughs> the year of the only a few, not not a whole bunch. I, you know, I, I guess you you kind of as you as you gain experience and as you're selling to more, you'll create those. I guess a little more formalized process of vetting out who is maybe the wrong customer yeah. and who you shouldn't be selling to because you're you're selling to the, I guess to the end retailer essentially, yeah. and uh, maybe there's a few less than scrupulous people out there. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess dealing with a lot of people, you start to be able to identify those people a little bit quicker. Uh, but a lot of times, some of these guys that do that do that very well, and so you know they're able to 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 trick their suppliers and to run one supplier up and then move on to the next. Uh, so, and I deal with bars and restaurants, grocery stores, convenience stores, dippers. So I deal with a lot of small customers. It's not really that easy to do credit checks on necessarily. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's just a question of of uh, imposing stricter rules with them. Do you, do you feel that because you're relatively new to the game that uh, people, some people can take advantage of you? No, I never really felt like anyone was out trying to take advantage of me. I think whoever did succeed in taking advantage of me took advantage of a lot of other suppliers as well. I don't think I was targeted in any way. Now, you're selling alcohol in many respects, at least that's one of your products. Insurance has got to play a huge role in this. Uh, what did you learn over your over these past few years as to what insurance do you need how do you cover your rear end yeah i mean not that much because th- that's part of the rules of the Reggie del Colo, the saq so uh they impose on us that we need a uh, liability insurance policy in quebec so um obviously we have one the brewery has insurance you know international uh, insurance policies as well so we're kind of double insured uh, within the province and then aside from that it's really just in- insuring my inventory insuring mm-hmm. my cargo and uh, obviously ensuring my employees. And there's no question there's, I mean, there's so much more in the industry itself as has changed, I'm sure, drastically over the years that, that you've been involved, let alone over the many years, which we haven't been able to get to, but uh, Fred and I, we'll, we'll see what we can do after the break, but we'll, we'll probably touch on marketing a lot more when we come back. Jason Haddam of Iconic Brands with us. We'll talk about marketing, about email marketing as well with Stephanie Darwish of Fuller Landau on the way. But first, 7.45. <laughs> For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people. Dan Delmar and Fuller Landau's Josh Miller with you and Jason Haddam from Iconic Brands is our guest this evening. We also bring in Stephanie Darwish from Fuller Landau to talk about marketing and in specific, uh, a great passion of yours, Stephanie, email marketing. It is a great passion. It's how I started my career it's almost 10 years ago now um, at McGill. I, I was in charge of all their email marketing for alumni. And I, I never, I didn't even know what HTML really was. So it was really, I learned as I went. And ever since then, email marketing will forever be in my heart. Now, email marketing, exactly what you think. You're sending, you, you create something that you want to send via email. Yes. And you, you get it out there. So the, what's so special about what's it? What's so special is that you can make them pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, despite um, 
the rise of social media marketing and um, ensuring that people are engaging with your brand on Facebook or Twitter, email marketing still does wonders and it still should be an important part of any company uh, marketing strategy. So I have like a few tips I'd like to share. <laughs> Go for it. Number one, um, and this is something that's often overseen because it, it just seems like an extra step that's not needed, but making sure you have a hosted version of your email somewhere. So that little line that says click here to view in a web browser so that, I mean, it's very rarely clicked unless there's a problem, but if there's a problem and someone wants to click and see your email, they're just frustrated. So at least if you have the hosted version somewhere and it's like click here to view in a browser, at least you're giving that problem email a little bit of a second chance. I guess you need a functional website, something that links to whatever you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. I mean, we're not even, I'm not even thinking about covering that actually, but it's true. You need a, first of all, an email marketing system. You need concepts. You need to make sure that you have your database clean. Like there's a whole bunch of other things. So get all that in place and then make sure you have a hosted version. Um, something else that people often forget that I actually learned at McGill was uh, to always have a little bit of copy um, before you click here to read this email and before your image. So I call that the header text because that's what shows up in the preview. And instead of um, in like an email preview, if you have an image that starts, it'll be like the HTML of like image source equals blah, blah, blah. And it's not readable. But if you have a little bit of header text, it's a bit of a second subject line and another way to get people to open your email. So giant sale, 50% off right now. We'll probably get someone to open it up quicker. So this is something that's not in the title not in the subject line but something else something else it's it's in your and i'm talking about emails not plain text emails i'm talking email marketing that are html emails with images and uh clickable links etc so this is before your main body of your email um even before your click here to view in a web browser or share this just a line of plain text that kind of enhances your subject line because your subject line is all super short. So this gives you a little bit extra real estate to entice people to open up your email. And I guess being in that we're in the lovely province of Quebec, when we always have to do things bilingual, it gives you that much more space to make sure you have a bilingual message. Well said, Josh. Well said, exactly. <laughs> I'm reading your mind, Steph, I know. <laughs> you are, you are. Here's a question, though. Uh, when can you email market to, to clients? Do they have to expressly give you an email address for that purpose, or you just collect them whenever, wherever you can? Um, so this is now because of Castle, the Canadian anti-spam law. Um, I don't want to give too much legal advice on this, but this is what I would do. Your clients, you have their email addresses. Those are people you can send emails to. Don't buy a list. Don't steal a list. If you find an email address on the internet, email once and respect unsubscribes. So... It's a bit, it's a bit touching. There's actually just uh, the first lawsuit under this law that came out. I don't have the details in front of me, but it wasn't like a spamming company. It was a regular business. It was a tech business actually, and they just recently got fined by Castle or are about to get fined. But um, I would say proceed on the uh, cautious side for now, anyways. Today's entrepreneur on CJAD, Stephanie Dawers, is here talking about email marketing and Jason Hattam of Iconic Brands. It's uh, seven fifty four. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered professional accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome back. We'll have Jason Hattam's one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur in just a moment. But first, uh, more chat about uh, email marketing with Stephanie Dawrsch of Fuller Landau. Now, we're talking before we left, Steph, you know, you had your tips and things you caught it, things entrepreneurs really got to respect when they're engaged in this email marketing campaigns. Uh, what else would you suggest that is an absolute must that you have to have on any, any one email? Well, by law now and by corporate responsibility or being a good business, you need to have an unsubscribe button that's visible and that works. So um, usually for for Fuller and for others, I always put it at the bottom of the email. If you no longer wish to receive, receive these messages, click here to unsubscribe. It's visible. They're taken to a clean and understandable uh, unsubscribe page where they can choose which mailings they no longer want to receive or they can globally unsubscribe. And uh, it's connected to a system that I can't resubscribe them without having to recreate the record. So I think that's very important. It builds trust, you know? Now, when you're when, when entrepreneurs are sending out or when they have these email marketing campaigns or they want to send it out, 
what do you feel is best? Is it, is it you have a line and you link it to their website or do you have the image, the HTML or whatever you want to call it, directly in the email? Uh, some people might have trouble downloading or seeing the pictures. What kind of works best if you, you know, from a consumer standpoint? Um, I always send two versions of the email and based on their email reader, they'll either get the text-based version, which just is uh, plain text with the URLs actually written out and the HTML version. version I'm having... <laughs> I'm having trouble with that word. One beer. One beer, <laughs> that was it. You know, it's so good, it, it just good, got to her. Good beer. Um, so the text version, and then the HTML version, which has the pretty images, all my nice formatting, a little bit of shadow boxes to uh, spice it up. And if the images don't work, and they didn't get the text version, that's why I have that click here to see in a web browser. Excellent. Thanks very much, Steph. And as we come to the last moment of the show, we'll, we'll turn to Jason as we do with every other entrepreneur. Um, I'll ask you, Jason, what would be your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur? I would say um, to just try to do your best, always keep sort of a longer term focus. If you know that things do make sense in your business and that you can make money doing what you're doing, um, and that fundamentally everything sound in the business to try to uh, just think of the longer term. You know, there's a lot of ups and downs. Um, you could get pretty low and pretty high at certain times to so try to stay even keeled and just keep that, that long-term focus at all times. And the, there's no question the, the takeaway that I got is certainly from a perseverance standpoint. I mean, you haven't been doing this for 20 years, but to have the patience to, you know, to spend 18 months waiting for your permit before you actually, you know, can deliver your, your, your first bottle of beer, I think, uh, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of, a lot of gumption and a lot of perseverance, a lot of belief in yourself and the product and, Certainly, that's uh, that's the makings of a successful entrepreneur. Thanks very much, Jason Haddam of Iconic Brands and Stephanie Darwish, of course, a marketing insight from Fuller Landau. And Josh will be back next week at 7 p.m., next Monday at 7 p.m. here on Today's Entrepreneur. It's uh, CJ80 time right now is 8 o'clock. The Exchange is next.